Oh, well, good morning everybody. Timer says we're good to go, so I guess we're good to go. So this talk is about uh, generating a hybrid CPU GPU code using template magic. And this is how to read the slides. First line just shows something that you may or may not want to know. Just take it as an FYI. The second line shows you something that is either a takeaway from this uh, talk or that you keep in mind for later. And the third line, uh, something that is code or a keyword will look like this. So let me introduce myself. I work as a scientific programmer at Forschungszentrum Jülich, which is, I think, Europe's uh, biggest interdisciplinary research center. And uh, our department is a service department for all things computer related to other departments. And uh, there I started uh, about 10 years ago to write a CUDA code for uh, different scientific problems. Uh, since then I've been a more or less regular presenter at the GPU Technology Conference and showing uh, talks and posters about codes or some interesting quirks that were used to speed them up. So, for those of you who haven't been paying attention in the last 10 years or so, it's a quick recap why you want to use GPUs. Basically, they're more efficient in many regards. So, they're much cheaper to buy than a CPU-based computer system of the same uh, compute power. They're more energy efficient and more space efficient because well, on one card you have what uh, you need, the whole computer or more. And you can put several cards into one machine and have the power of a small cluster in the box. And, well, people might tell you, okay, I've got this 100 times speed up using GPUs. And, well, I won't tell you they're, they're lying. But usually, if you have that kind of speed up, you should have taken uh, better uh, care of your other code. And, as always, there's a catch. GPU is only an accelerator. You don't have an operating system uh, running on it. You don't uh, get to run every program you have on it. So you just send off part of your problem. And this is only uh, efficient if you have problems that fit the architecture. We'll get to that later, what fits and what doesn't. And besides that, there are more complicated the program uh, because you have to get into the architecture, the threading model, and the memory model. And uh, speaking about memory, you're often very limited. So the code or the project uh, is around for uh, about nine years now when people came to our group and asked, how can we make this algorithm faster? And this algorithm is called multi-particle collision dynamics. Basically, uh, it's an element-based approach to uh, hydrodynamic interactions. You have millions of particles uh, floating around and interacting with each other and with other stuff that may have been submerged in these particles. And we use these to uh, simulate polymers or uh, microbes or whatever you can imagine is small and swims. And uh, about two years ago, I started on a also CPU based uh, approach for this code because uh, we have also some uh, supercomputing resources at our hand, but uh, traditional CPU based. And uh, people didn't want to use one code for one machine and another code for the other. And during this, I found out that the code bases are converging and that they can be converged into one by making all the scientific code platform agnostic. And uh, all the architecture specific code was just moved into in classes. If you want to use GPUs for calculation, uh, you somehow have to get your code into them. And you can deal with different approaches. Uh, the easiest 
might be the uh, Pragma-based uh, models, if you're familiar with OpenMP. Now, the newer versions of OpenMP support GPU computing. Similar to this, we have OpenACC, and we have some language extensions. OpenCL, which is based or usable for many multi and many core platforms. CUDA from uh, NVIDIA, mostly or only running on their GPUs. HIP, which is very similar to CUDA, and uh, is also said to compile to code that runs on NVIDIA devices. To be honest, I've never tried it. Here I found out about uh, SICL, which is uh, domain-specific language on top of OpenCL. And for those who want to go deep down hardcore, you can always do your calculations in OpenGL shaders. So, a few disclaimers to make. I'm not affiliated with the video. Uh, the architecture features and some details here uh, clearly apply to NVIDIA because I'm using CUDA code here. But most of it should be doable on other platforms. And, well, if your GPU is quite old, let's say before 2012, you may be out of luck and this isn't working for you. Even if it's an NVIDIA GPU, because it's uh, lacking the capabilities. So, why am I using CUDA? Uh, historically, back in 2008, there wasn't much uh, choice. You could do OpenGL shaders, or you could do CUDA, or you could do even more obscure things that uh, I wasn't even aware of. And uh, the C++ support for CUDA has been a little bit uh, small at first, but it's growing for years now. And uh, many features of uh, C++14 are at least partially supported. Also, we had uh, we had uh, NVIDIA GPUs, and uh, I also like the syntax better. And I said you might uh, do it, or you might just some of the stuff presented on other platforms too. So, some lingo. So everybody knows what I'm talking about. If I talk about a device, I mean a GPU. If I mean a host, it's usually the box that the GPU is uh, put in. And the uh, bus is something that connects some component with another component. Kernel is a piece of code running on a GPU. And the device function is some kind of C++ function that can only be called from within a kernel, not from your host. So, let me get to what's inside a GPU. And uh, you have one or more compute units, up to well, at least 16 at the moment, maybe more. It's hard to keep track. And uh, each of these compute units, which had several names over the past, uh, I think they were called SMXs at some point, something different. So I just say with compute units, you have a SIMD architecture, and uh, each of these compute units can usually handle three-digit number of threads in parallel, and also has a different number for some special of uh, units for some special operations like uh, trigonometric functions or exponents or something, and uh, for different types of data. So. The base type for GPU computation is uh, usually just float. And uh, you get a differing number of uh, compute units being able to uh, compute double precision numbers or integer numbers. And each compute unit has some kind of internal memory only available or accessible to threads that reside on this particular compute unit. Then the device has uh, some more memory. That's what you usually uh, see in the specs, like 8 gigs of GDDR5. And this is usually uh, available to all the compute units. And of course, you need a bus interface to uh, connect to the outside world. So uh, here's a scheme. To, here you see. Uh, the device itself, the GPU, it, this one contains four compute units with 
a big number of calculation units. They have their shared memory where that they can use and they have a big register set and are connected to device memory and to the CPU and via that to the host memory, but we'll get to that later. So the SIMD architecture has some limitations and uh, one of these is uh, that a certain number of uh, threads is lockstep. In uh, CUDA speak we call them a warp and uh, it's usually 32 threads and uh, they all do the same or, they, or those who do not want to do what the others do, do nothing. This means uh, if you have branched code, it will serialize and this is something you want to avoid, at least if you go deep down somewhere or have uh, switches with more or less random values uh, that are not dependent on a thread ID and not the same dependent on a thread ID. Otherwise, well, you will get to know the slow speed pelican, which we will see more often today. And uh, whatever the hardware can do is called compute capability. And they changed, of course, over times. Back when I started, uh, for the first project, we needed double precision compute capability. And so we started using this when the first GPUs came out that did this. That was in about 2008. And some features that we need here came out with the Kepler architecture in 2012. And this brings us to, uh, they came, they were the first to support managed memory and this is what we need here. But let me introduce you to the types of memory that you find in a GPU equipped system. You have the memory connected to your CPU, which we call the host memory. It's just your plain old memory. If, if you can afford that, you can have uh, almost as much as you want of it today. And this memory is usually paged, so it can also uh, be moved into your swap file on your disk. And uh, to avoid that, you can pin it. Pinned memory is not pageable anymore, thereby, uh, therefore can be uh, accessed over the PCI Express bus. But then you can access from the GPU. But unless you really, really need it, or it's just to store off a single result, you may not always want to do it because it's slow. Then we have the device memory, usually in the order of 1 to 32 gigs. And a high speed bus on the device, 256, 384 bits, maybe even wider by now, uh, which is quite fast going out to 700 gigabytes per second with the latest models. But this may sound much, but it's still a limiting factor. And this memory is not accessible to the GPU. Shared memory is on chip, or uh, better said, within the compute unit. It's small and uh, well, actually, for this, uh, it's accessible to all the threads running on this particular compute unit, but we don't need this today. Then we have something called the constant cache, which is an obscure little area on each uh, compute unit. And uh, there you can store whatever constants your code needs, and the API use it, uses this uh, to store kernel arguments, which will become uh, important later. And the memory that you're usually working in or want your threads to work in are the registers. So each thread can have a big number of registers. And uh, we have lots of them on each device, but uh, yeah, it's never enough. Then we come to what we need today most. It's called managed memory, which is not a physical part of memory, but something that is copied around by the API uh, whenever you need it. Usually the earlier GPU codes always have the problem that whatever you want to use in a GPU, you have to copy there. And if you're done using it and need the results, you need to copy the results back. So with every call that you make, you have a bunch of mem copy calls or other mem copy calls to put it there, retrieve it, and uh, 
this was tedious. And uh, then they came up with something called managed memory, which is uh, which was at first some underlying software layer uh, putting or automatically uh, putting your data where you needed it. And uh, there have been uh, more hardware implementations for this lately. And uh, devices from Pascal on uh, can use uh, true paging, have a true paging engine. Uh, with this, uh, you can also use more device memory than you actually have on the device, and it will be paged in and out. But uh, sometimes this comes with performance issues if you don't tell the API exactly what you want to do with this memory. So here's our Pelican again. And as I told you, device memory is fast, but often not as fast as you would uh, like it to be. And Forever, uh, for every device memory access, you get uh, hundreds of clock cycles of latency, which the device tries to hide by using some now dormant threads that uh, were waiting for the memory accesses before, and now it's ready. And you always get to read your memory in chunks of 128 uh, bytes, <coughs> which. Uh, is good if you uh, use adjacent memory or uh, yeah or want your threads to read consecutive data and uh, this is very bad if you have real random accesses or if you have strided data and don't think about caches they're pretty small and uh, usually you see a memory as a streaming memory and I was talking about threads a little bit and uh, yeah, well, the threading model is that all your threads are put uh, into uh, the number of threads that you have is divided into uh, thread blocks, which can have up to uh, 1024 threads each. Each compute unit can, match, uh, can manage 2048 threads at a time, but as I say manage, not compute them at the same time. It can only compute a three-digit number of them, and all the others are dormant, waiting to be used. It's a uh, scheduler within the compute unit. And the, the execution order of your blocks is not defined. And your threads can only communicate within the block using shared memory, or uh, sometimes exchange data directly. And with, uh, outside the block, you usually cannot communicate. You can put something into device memory, but you never know if the thread you want to communicate with is currently active somewhere, or is already done, or hasn't even started yet. So uh, all the blocks together are called a grid. And uh, the block and grid dimensions can be three-dimensional if it helps you to code your problem and uh, yeah well each thread uses resources so uh, maybe you cannot manage or maybe your compute uh, unit cannot manage all the 2048 uh, threads that it could manage in theory so you come up uh, with something called the occupancy of a device which is the ratio between Threads are able to run and threads being theoretically able to run. So you have uh, your threads here. They are divided into thread blocks. And the thread blocks are sent off to different compute units with, like I said, an uh, undefined execution order. So, Thread index uh, can be more or less easily calculated. Uh, there are some limitations on it, but they should be sufficient for most problems that we have today. So, what exactly is Qt C++? I tend to talk about it or call it a, sub, a superset of a subset of C++. Superset, because of its language, language extensions to handle threading in memory, and a subset because not everything you can do in C++ 
is uh, possible or allowed to do in uh, C++. We don't have uh, device-side support for STL containers, which is very, very sad, but for some uh, of these containers it's just not feasible or not useful. But still, vector would have been nice. Uh, we cannot pass classes with virtual members to kernels. They have different v-tables, but you can uh, construct classes with uh, virtual members, but you cannot pass them back, of course. Uh, recursions, uh, well, on some levels yes, on some levels no, and no exception handling. And device code, and, well, these are just the most important ones. There are more. Uh, with the CUDA software, there comes the compiler named uh, NVCC, which basically relies on the system compiler, and usually not on the version that you have installed and are using. It will complain, I do not support this version of GCC, please fall back to I don't know what. And uh, uh, I think it doesn't even tell you what to fall back to. And it calls uh, some. Uh, in an intermediate step, it calls uh, PTX code, which is device assembler, which in turn is called into some kind of byte code to be compiled for the actual device, either at compile time, if you give the appropriate flags, or at runtime. And also, you can uh, compile CUDA directly with some newer releases of Clang. So we have different kinds of uh, functions that we have to deal with. Uh, one uh, kind of function is the host function, which lives and works on the host and on the host only. Uh, since your STL is not CUDA aware, uh, all STL versions are by nature host functions and are not usable on the device. Maybe some of them are constacts, and then you may use them with limitations. You can try. Device functions are only, uh, uh, yeah, they do live on the device, and they only uh, run, can only run there. And they can be called from kernels or other device functions, and by default, they're inline. And uh, on third level, they allow recursion. And also, uh, you can tell the compiler to, to not inline them, but make some real uh, object code of them that uh, can be uh, taken to address of, used as uh, function pointers on the GPU. And uh, host device functions work in both worlds, but uh, you cannot have one host and one device function that share the same signatures. Uh, I've heard that this is different when you're using Clang, but I've never tried it. So you need different means to separate them. Then we have global functions, which is the function type for kernel. Uh, the, um, the global functions yeah, become kernels when compiled, are always of return type void and run asynchronously on the device when invoked from the GPU. And uh, for some architectures, they may be uh, called also from global functions. And you definitely need to get to give them a thread configuration. If you just try to run them from the GPU, it will tell you, no, I don't know what to do it with, from the CPU. If a compiler will tell you, I don't know what to do with this. Tell me about the thread layout. And from there, you can only call device and some console expression functions. And sometimes other global functions. So within uh, NVCC, we have uh, at least these two important macros here. QDCC tells us we're currently uh, working on a source code that was meant to be compiled for uh, CUDA. And CUDA Arch tells us what compute capability uh, this code if we are currently uh, compiling device code, was meant to work for. When you uh, run your compiler, you can tell it, build me uh, some code for device capabilities 3, 3.5, and 5. And then it will do, do three separate runs 
compiling uh, for these versions. So when you want to allocate memory there, or GPU memory, there are different ways to do that. QDA malloc uh, gives you device memory, QDA malloc host gives you pinned host memory, QDA malloc memory uh, managed is what we want to do, managed memory that is passed around automatically. And uh, within device code you can do a malloc which goes into some uh, very special kind of buffer residing in device memory and pretty inaccessible from many other places. So a device function is, uh, yeah, well, labeled as a device function, it has uh, more or less any return value that you want to give it. It looks just like your regular C++ function. And this one here returns a linear thread index, uh, um, computed out of the block index and the thread index. And uh, when we want to uh, call a kernel, I told you we have to give a call configuration, thread configuration. And uh, the grid size, well, you need to have uh, a thread in some block for each thread that you want to run. So your number of blocks is basically uh, some like seal of the number of uh, threads that you have divided by the block size. And then you use this handy operator here. Uh, looks a little bit like the new spaceship operator, a little bit, and it's used to configure a kernel call. And I told you the uh, grid dimensions, the block dimensions can be up to three dimensional and there's a special type for this, but for the scope of this talk, we are good with it. Kernels look like this. You have your global keyword here, declaring it a kernel. They're always of type void and besides that look like your regular function here. You can pass something and this one will get some raw pointers to ints, uh, calculate its own thread index within the grid, and uh, if this is less than some upper threshold, we'll just add the vector contents of the first two to the last one. And yeah, well, you have to have some block size, usually it's a power of two, and uh, you have some number of threads, and then you calculate your uh, matching grid size for this dependent on the block size and send it all off to the API. And afterwards you have to synchronize because it runs asynchronously. If you access your uh, results too early, you will get some kind of error. So what's wrong with this concept? Not much if you like a repetitious code. And uh, yeah, well, you want, uh, you want cleaner code, you do not want to do everything twice, and, well, the lots of if devs you get are not, are not nice. But there's something we can do about it, and, or at least we can set a goal that we you know, want to do about it, and that's writing hybrid code that runs everywhere. And so, uh, yeah, the code itself or the compiler should decide where this is best run. And for this we need some things. So we need uh, something to wrap the semantics of our code in. And we need uh, transparent, I mean, uh, by this I mean the, the common language semantics, not necessarily what's uh, now the C++ semantics. Uh, transparent access to memory of all your uh, or to some memory that's accessible from all the architectures. And in the real production code or the platform agnostic code, you don't want to uh, deal with the actual extensions or uh, quirks of your target architecture. And somehow you need to deploy your work to the architecture you want to use. And uh, I'm going to show you how you can accomplish that using only C++ and a little bit of Qt. 
So if you want to do it, yeah, you need some code that can take advantage of it. And uh, that's usually something that some loops that you can uh, parallelize using OpenMP in a more or less simple way like this. If you can do this, and if your number of loop iterations is big enough, you have a good candidate. It will not pay off to send something that does 50 iterations because your uh, overhead will be much higher than your gain. So, how do I pass my data around? Managed memory is very good for this, but uh, by default you only get uh, raw pointers from it. And uh, that's not what you want to uh, work with. Stud vector with a managed memory allocator sounds like a good idea, but as I told you, uh, it only has uh, host member functions. So if you try to do something like this, you will get an error message like uh, operator brackets is not defined for device code. So if you write your own structures, you can pass them a, a new operator that will uh, allocate their memory in, uh, uh, in managed memory, and then you can access them from everywhere. It could look like some, uh, something like this. And uh, this was uh, something that I found uh, when the managed memory feature early came uh, out in the NVIDIA dev blocks. I extended it with uh, a check if we actually get uh, a good pointer, but yeah, it's basically this. And also, I introduced uh, some tech here that we can use later to decide uh, or to help us decide what to do with whatever comes out of this. Then there is a, sim a very uh, simple allocator for managed memory, which also uh, uses CUDA malloc managed here and the back allocator check. And uh, this is more or less what you find in Beyond the Stroke Stops book as the most simple allocator that works. Extended with CUDA malloc managed. What else do we need? We usually want to have a vector type. Basic functionality of a vector type like is, uh, well, I would define it as a uh, bracket operator because that's what you use most. So uh, this is fairly easy to write. Some things are not so easy to do yourself. Yeah, well, you have to deal with all the housekeeping. And uh, some things semantically do not make sense. So. Uh, I may want to insert elements, but uh, if one thread of a million inserts some elements somewhere, there is no way to tell the other uh, threads, hey, I've just inserted an element. So all of their uh, references or whatever will be will become invalid. Same with the race and the place. Technically, it's not possible uh, to allocate managed memory from the device, so we cannot resource or reserve. And uh, if we run out of capacity when uh, you're doing a pushback, well, yeah, like I said, we cannot resize, and so we're out of luck. Uh, I, uh, or uh, accompanying these slides, there will be a simple piece of uh, a stud vector equivalent, and this has no value reference overloads and works only for trivial copy. Uh, trivially copyable types, etc. But for most high performance things it should work. So uh, here's what something inside looks like. So uh, we have the resource function which is not declared as anything, meaning that it is by default a host function, we can call it from the device, but all the access operators we can call from the host and the device. And 
something like this is done for more or less every member function there is. Then you need a way to wrap whatever you want to do. And uh, I chose to use a functor because they are configurable on many levels, or two levels at least, so you can uh, use template arguments on the class and on their call operator, but also uh, give some more information within the class, like should I usually run this on the GPU anyway, or should I prefer the CPU, what's my uh, best block size, and so on. It could work like this. The housekeeping information I told you about uh, is put into this hybrid functor thing that we inherit from. This pragma is just to silence CUDA from warning us about something we are not actually doing. And uh, here you can have uh, any kind of uh, device function or device function template that you want to have as a call operator. And then you need to pass this to the GPU or to wherever you want to deploy your code. For the CPU it's uh, yeah, well, more or less trivial. You pass all your arguments to, some, uh, to the operator that does the actual work. Uh, here are two operators. Uh, this one is for uh, the case where we give the number of uh, iterations that we want to have explicitly. And then we just uh, instantiate our functor and call the call operator with uh, the arguments, forwarded arguments. And if we use this mechanism with a type that has a certain size. We usually want to use the uh, size uh, as the number of threads, so it's just a convenience overload here. But now the tricky part comes. How do we decide if some arguments that we pass allow running on the GPU? So we can pass L value references if they are residing in device accessible memory. That should be fine. And uh, the tagging that we did on the new uh, operator helps finding out what these are. But even if they inherit this new operator, not all objects of this kind really live in a device accessible memory. So if they're just uh, defined like this, they're put somewhere in a heap, which is not device accessible. So we need to explicitly use new somewhere. Also, if we have now value that's trivially copyable, we can just uh, yeah, trivially copy it. And uh, as I told you, uh, types of virtual members do not work. You cannot pass them. And uh, also, like I said, you may want to limit what you put on the GPU or not. And if everything is accessible by the device, we can pass our whole call to the device. So for the case that we have here, we need to check. It's not enough to check the types. Uh, where am I here? And uh, so for our values, this is uh, trivial. For our L value references, not so much. So you can check for the, for the type first. If the type is not device accessible, well, you don't need to check any further. But if it is, you have something uh, like pointer attributes in CUDA. And you uh, give a pointer to it and it will tell you where the stuff pointed to actually lives. If it's not a CUDA allocated pointer, you will get an error in this return type, then just uh, collect this error, return false, and be done with it. You may want to check 
that it's really the error that comes from here, not just some older error that is uh, that was stuck in the system. And you better do uh, something more or cancel the code, whatever you prefer here. And if we survive this, we get a device accessible pointer and can return true. So based on this, we can decide where to actually deploy our call. So, yeah, well, if everything is accessible by the device, even at runtime, we can deploy to the GPU. Otherwise, we fall back to the CPU. This uh, bool parameter here, template parameter, tells us where to run. And we need to forward all the arguments and our functor itself. And uh, in all the CUDA releases, we do not, uh, in all the C++ releases, we do not have a, um, a, what's it called, const expression if. So it doesn't, act, the compiler doesn't know which perform we are really going to call, or if we're not going to call both performs, and so it, it will follow both paths, and uh, will complain about having to do some CUDA stuff with non-CUDA types. So we need to double check here. So on the CUDA side, we need some kind of wrapper kernel, global functions that, that accepts our functor and uh, unwraps. Oh, yeah, that's the point. Uh, kernels cannot accept our value references because uh, whatever these references <coughs> reference to usually live in device memory that's not necessarily uh, accessible and uh, we need to wrap all the stuff we pass to global functions. So we write a little wrapper class if it is device accessible and if it is an, R, uh, an L value reference we just pass the reference or we, we wrap the reference and for everything else we try to wrap the value of it and here we have a little maker for this so we don't have too much code load but uh, uh, passing L value references is somewhat overrated because it's slower actually in the kernel, you have to dereference your reference to access whatever there is. So you have a reference you read from the uh, from your argument and then you dereference it and then you read again from the device code, uh, from the device memory. And this can be a bit slow and tedious, so if you can pass more value, it's sometimes preferable. And so, we have our wrapper function for our kernel. Again, we get uh, lots of arguments here that are wrapped somehow. And uh, we get the default block size of f. And then we try to run our generic kernel with uh, a, configura a thread configuration based on this block size and uh, forward all the arguments to it and this may result in errors. If we do not have uh, enough resources to run with this third configuration, we uh, get uh, what's it called a launch out of resources error, which is usually harmless. We reduce the block size and try again. If we get a real error, we try to die somewhat gracefully. And now a little bit underwhelming the wrapper kernel just takes functor arguments, uh, will calculate its thread index, and if this is below the threshold, it will instantiate a functor, pass uh, and pass the, the index and uh, the unwrapped arguments to it. So the, all of this is probably hurting performance because it's so much layers of passing things and stuff and so on. But, no. Uh, don't worry, he just went out of scope. 
So, as an example, there are always different ways to try uh, to achieve the same thing. Uh, here is a functor of the kind that I showed you before. Uh, multiplying some vector with an int. And here is a handwritten GPU kernel that uh, does the same. And if we compile them, we can keep the PDX code coming from this, the GPU assembly, and they basically compile to the same instructions. The order is a little bit different, but they do the same, so there is no performance penalty for going through the functors and the argument wrappers. So if I want to use this code that I just show you, if you want to use it, it's a simple code, works pretty simple, you just include hybrid.hpp. It will automatically detect if you want to make a CUDA code or, or if what you want to compile is a CUDA code file or is a plain CPP file. And uh, we'll set some macros and include some other stuff depending on the cases. And then for device code or no, for host code, you just use C++ compiler of your choice with it. And if you want to uh, do the actual hybrid code, you use the MVCC. And uh, there are literally hundreds of options to this. So you may want to consult the compiler help or the manual, let alone that. So here's a small example, adding two vectors. We get some vector type here, two const vectors of something, and two const vector references of something, and a not const reference for the results. And yeah, plain as hell, we just add stuff up. So we initialize a bunch of stud vectors and we initialize a bunch of hybrid vectors with the same data. Hybrid vector is uh, an alias template that will, depending on your uh, architecture or your compiler, choose what kind of vector to use if you want to use hybrid code. And then we deploy this, either with all the CPU vectors or with all the GPU vectors and we get a result which is the same as it should be and if I were to mix CPU and GPU vectors here it would see that at least one of our arguments is not device accessible and it would fall back to the CPU call. Now we get something different, sounds like a histogram just a simple kernel that counts the odd and even numbers uh, up to the threshold. And uh, yeah, we just uh, increment either uh, the first or second element of V depending on a thread index. We make again a hybrid vector and a stud vector for it, deploy it to the CPU and the GPU. And we get an output. Oops. So this is not what we wanted. So what happened? In a parallel system, it often happens that uh, multiple threads try to update the same data at the same time. You get a read, modify, write problem. And for that, you need well, one solution for that are atomic operations. In CUDA, we have several of them for adding, incrementing, uh, atomic min, max, and or, and some more complicated stuff like exchange and compare and swap, all have their uh, reasons for existence. But, yeah, well, we don't want to uh, put something like this into our actual production code. Or, oh, well, not in our production code, in our in the code that shows what we actually want to do. We want to keep it architecture free or architecture agnostic. And in C++, you can build a class for this. 
So let's just hold it counter and pass it some type that should probably be checked to be some kind of integer. And uh, we want to be able to uh, construct it on either the host or device, and we want to do uh, everything on it on either the host or the device. And uh, yeah, we can access its value and we can reset it to some value, and we want to be able to count using the different increment operators. And here we have uh, two different paths, one for CUDA, one for the host. On the host we just use the C++ uh, standard operators here, and uh, on the device we call an atomic add to the address of our value and add one. Uh, you may ask why not use atomic ink? Atomic ink is limited to 32-bit uh, integer types, so uh, if you want to use a size T, you're out of luck here. So, here we have the same code again, and instead of pass or using a, a hybrid vector of ints, we use a hybrid vector of counters, which I should have done up here too just to show you that it works on uh, both sides. Um, and we get the result we hope for. So, does this actually give you any advantage in a real-world application? Well, it does. This uh, is the uh, multi-particle collision dynamics algorithm I talked about. And I tested it on the uh, different uh, architectures. The blue line is uh, a bunch of nodes on uh, one of our high-performance clusters and using uh, up to 192 CPU cores we get a throughput of roughly 1200 million particles per second. And uh, if you use one box containing four uh, GTX 1080 GPUs, we get more than that at a fraction of the price point. Uh, same here, these nodes also contain GPUs. So if we use the four, uh, the eight GPUs uh, that are uh, located in the same four, uh, no, in actually these two hosts here, we get a speed up of about a factor of uh, seven, no, three, three and a half, sorry. So, and this is what we use this for. These are so called uh, squirmers. Uh, they, they are little uh, microbes that live in water, and we want to simulate their behavior. And this was still uh, done using uh, the old code which was not hybrid and only single GPU. And this had a walt log time, the simulation that you see here, of two to three weeks. And uh, going hybrid and going multi-GPU, through this hybrid code, we expect this to be much, much faster than before. So, which brings me to the end of my talk. And uh, you can uh, find the slides on the talks uh, cppcon uh, site and also uh, sample code. So, any questions? Hi. Um, just to save, let's say, development time, did you try using some other frameworks in other languages? Let's say TensorFlow, but not the ML part of it, but just as a generic compute engine? Uh, no, not yet. I, I'm planning to? Uh, probably, yeah. Well, the next thing on my plate is extending this for Xeon Phi, even though it may be only of limited lifetime anymore, so 
I don't know if and when I would find time for this. Okay, thanks. Uh, speaking of Xeon Phi, uh, how does it compare to the NVIDIA GPU platform? Did you make some comparative test? Because I saw you showed only NVIDIA GPU family when you showed the performance with respect uh, to general purpose the CPU. The Xeon Phi code is in the pipeline, but it's not existent yet. Did you try to compare with other frameworks like Trillinos Cocos, which basically do the same, so they try to be also performance portable? Um, I wanted to be as uh, framework independent as possible. So I just want to have something that can throw at more or less any C++ compiler without having to care uh, about getting any frameworks. Okay. Uh, so, uh, did you publish in GitHub this uh, code? Uh, is it valuable to for public consumption? Or? Uh, like I said, the sample code uh, is included with the f downloadable files okay. on the CPPCon talk uh, web on the CPPCon website for this talk. Okay, because the real value of what you did actually, as you said, it's because it's platform independent. The last thing you would want is to tie this uh, specific optimization to one single uh, NVIDIA specific, you know, computational model when there will be more and more from different uh, manufacturers. So. More of an MD point of view question. I mean, did you compare the performance with, say, your algorithm to like Amber or Gromax? Because uh, they also have GPU implementations, uh, right? Uh, I, well, actually, I do not do the domain specific code. Okay. So I would try, I would have to, to try to convince our domain scientists to write or to use the same thing in Amber, usually they come up with some things that they want included that are not necessarily available in the packages uh, that you can, yeah, well, in the MD packages that are around. And just one more, so the simulations is sure that they're fully atomic, like when you were doing so, polymers. So are they coarse grained or, I mean, they are fully atomic level simulations? Because, um, I mean, you were using the multi-particle collision dynamics for yes. simulating polymers, right? Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, I mean... The multi-particle collision dynamics, yeah, simulates not the polymers, but the hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic interactions Okay. the polymers. And the uh, algorithm itself uh, divides your uh, number of, uh, or your system into uh, small cells and... Uh, like only operates uh, on the cells within, no, on the particles within each cell. Like a Borrelius kind of thing. Uh, and it's a statistical thing. You do not do really actual collisions between okay, single okay. particles. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, no more questions then. Again, thank you for your time.